hang tight. Welcome to the Scratch Pad Show. This is just basically where I come to scratch out some ideas, some shenanigans, things that wouldn't necessarily be on the Backpack Show, but are something that are interesting to me. Chris Brogan, I grabbed John Warlow and made him sit down because he's working on a new book. He's got a book out, and it's not anything we talk about on Backpack, but John, I told you this before we went live. You changed my business. Your book, The Automatic Customer, there's before John's book and there's after John's book. <laughs> <laughs> I so you said you know you'd be smarter if you ran subscription based businesses and things with monthly recurring revenue and I was like he's right and and to me that's your big book because that was your big book to me but yeah, you're known for built, you're known for built to sell and, and and you have this whole trajectory so for people who just showed up and said who's John again um, which there's two of them that's all that's left in the country <laughs> what on earth. What makes you go after these subjects? Why this? And then we'll talk about your new book, The Art of Selling Your Business. Well, you're very kind, first of all, to I say am. all that. <laughs> it's very kind. I'm glad it helped. And uh, and yeah, I mean, look, I uh, I, I don't know. The, um, the whole idea of building to sell was one that I kind of stumbled into because I'd screwed up and made lots of mistakes in my own businesses and learn the hard way of what makes them sellable. So Built to Sell was in a lot of ways a book that I wrote to to sort of explain all the mistakes I, I made and how to avoid them effectively. And then the one thing that we didn't do enough of in Built to Sell was recurring revenue. Because if there's anything that accelerates the value of a company, it's recurring revenue. So that's the book that you're referencing, The Automatic Customer, which is sort of that, again, once you built a company that you could kind of sell, you pour lighter fluid on it and uh, you get uh, recurring revenue really ac accelerates the value. So yeah, I'm glad so, it helped you. What did you do in your business that made it more of a subscription offering? Well, so everything. So we were selling, you know, the thing that we sold the most besides some coaching is we were selling uh, courses and webinars. So we were doing uh, basically a product launch formula kind of a situation. And I'm in no way trashing product launch formula because boy, those... He's done very well, and a lot, a lot of people are really uh, successful and grateful for uh, product launch formula. And uh, by the way, the book, like you could buy the course for like twenty five hundred bucks, or you could buy the book for like fourteen bucks, and still do the same thing. Oh, it's really? Ridiculous. But guess what? He sells that course into the ground because people want it. But it's a launch process, you know. Rev up for the launch. I'm X weeks out. I'm going to get these people. I'm going to try this thing. All your friends are going to start sending the same copy paste email and it's going to go like that. And that's how a lot of people do their online business, especially selling knowledge product things. So John, your book says, you know what you should have is recurring revenue because then you could just point to that line item when someone's thinking about buying you, which I missed that part of the book, and uh, say, look, I've got recurring revenue. And the whole world suddenly for me was like, yeah. So if I look at that line and I could say, I'm expecting whatever the numbers are, like 12,000 bucks a month, then all I have to know is, is it 12,000? No, it's a little low. Okay, get some more people. Okay, great. Now it's 12,000 again. And that's all I had to, to market to. And if I wanted 5% more, then I would just market that much more to try to get that. It makes business just run if you sell a reasonably predictable product. Is that who, who should buy that book, The Automatic Customer? You know anyone who's in a transaction business right now, and you got you're pulling up this this. I don't know where this <laughs> rating <Right>. comes from, <laughs> okay. but we got to pull up a different rating because it, it actually isn't a one star rated. Yeah, this one says the yeah, only one person rated that particular copy of that paper, <laughs> and it's like a one star. Oh, I'm like, so oh, funny. I'm so sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't even look. That's so I'm funny. At that. That's awesome. Anyway, it's um, look nice. anybody who's in a transaction business model where. It's kind of one and done. The idea is 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 really to create a tail to the revenue, and it's interesting. One of the things that we we get a lot of questions around is like, how do I do this in fill in the blank industry? Maybe it's uh, you know retail or manufacturing, distribution, whatever. Uh, oh, thanks for putting that one up. Sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm like there is, there are a couple of other ratings out there. Uh, anyone in a different industry where it's not traditionally thought of as subscription uh, revenue, or you know, uh, I think that's the person that that could read this. So, 
you know, I, I, th I think of one guy who, or one industry that has really been transformed lately, and you may have seen this in your own backyard, is car washes. Like car washes were the quintessential old school, right? Like on the quarter of the, you know, the busy part, you know, uh, intersection, you'd have a car wash. And yeah. the value of that company was primarily the land and the intersection, right? Well, they've all moved to subscription offerings now where you buy like this unlimited, all you can eat sort of subscription. You can get your car washed as many times as you want. And it's transformed the industry. And so there's an example uh, you know, private equity is now rolling up these car washes and paying like crazy multiples for these businesses because they've got this sort of tail to the revenue. So that's if you're in an industry where you're trying to figure out how do I create some recurring revenue, that that's a that's a book that might be helpful. That's interesting. That's, you know, and car wash is one. And it's interesting which ones can take advantage of this, too, which is, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, massage therapy or whatever, like I'm any kind sure. of service this, you know, has a, a good chance about that, right? Yeah. Anywhere you could put a, like a, a, a contract, a service contract in place, carpet cleaning, home cleaning, everything up to uh, even retail stores. There's a nice little story in the book about H. Bloom, who took the business of selling flowers and moved it to subscription because they found Perfect. hotels were, were buying flowers on a regular basis. Not these days, but in a, in a regular economy, they're buying flowers and regular cadence. Yeah, so yeah, and, and I think the secret that I've come to learn since the, writing the book that I wish mm -hmm. I'd included, but but didn't, so I'll have to write a part two at some point, was that was that segmenting your customers down by type mm -hmm. is probably the best first step to creating a subscription because it's only when you actually create these buckets of like homogeneous buying behaviors does the subscription model sort of emerge naturally? If you try to boil the ocean and try to look at all of your customers and say, who, like, how do I come up with a subscription for everybody? You're almost defined to like dilute it down to something that's not going to be meaningful to anybody. Whereas if you say, okay, the, you know, I've got these kinds of customers who buy regularly. They want this from me. These other ones want something different. That's when you can really start to create something meaningful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to do, I'm going to jump the book that you're probably most known for, Built to Sell. Because I want to talk about the new one. I want to talk about sure. the one that's coming out because, uh, you know, that's why we're here. So you have a new book called The Art of Selling Your Business, which kind of comes off tail of Built to Sell, but it also sort of fits in a story arc. And that's why I wanted to jump because I want to say, John Warlow, tell me why this book, tell me where your head's been over the last handful of years now and sort of sure. tell the story of this is what you keep wanting to bring to the marketplace. Why? Yeah, essentially because I don't think it's well served. So the whole trilogy of books is built to sell is about how do you create a business that's valuable, the automatic, the automatic customer about how do you accelerate that value. And then the artist sell, selling your business is about how to harvest that value. And what I've sort of learned is that because when you sell a small business, and when I say small business, I'm referring to, you know, something yeah, you were from, let's say a million to 20, 30, 40 million, those businesses sell and the owner has to sell sign a confidentiality agreement, basically mm -hmm. saying that they won't say anything about the business forever. And that's great for the buyer because they don't get their multiples revealed to the world and all their negotiating hacks and tactics. The problem though, is that the sale of a privately held business is this opaque behind the curtain thing that nobody learns about, right? right. And that's why so many small business owners unfortunately go and sell and and lose money and get duped into these crazy deals because there's no real best practices out there. So that's what I'm I'm personally fascinated by sure. and, and spend a lot of time on. Uh, so one thing I know about business selling and it, the so I'm so not smart. Like you'll get that pretty <laughs> fast. <laughs> Truly though, like I'm not being humble. Like I, I always say it, people are like, oh, and I'm really not smart. The um <laughs> when people talk about selling in multiples and things like that, it's like, you know, multiple of your revenue. So for instance, if I make 2 million bucks, if you're selling at one, you know, giving to me at 1.5, you're going to give me 3 million bucks for my, my $2 million, you know, revenue. If I've shown a trend, which is kind right. of where I'm my customer said, you know, you, you want to show a trend. Here's one way. Um, so uh, certain businesses sell on multiples that are amazing and other businesses sell on multiples that are really close to the vest because you're not sure. So for, for instance, event companies almost always sell at like one to 1.5. Like they'll say, well, we'll give you whatever you made for your last event. Have a nice day. And so you may get like pickup truck money out of that. You know, you, you're, you're probably not necessarily going to get name an island kind of money. Do you want to talk for just a minute? Or do you know? Probably you do because you're smart. 
do you know some of the companies like that are like if, if someone were thinking of like here i am in the crushed economy i had to lose my job now i'm going to start another business like i'm, I'm not ready to sell but i want to build it to sell hey that'd be a good idea for a book <laughs> and i want to make some automatic customers and then i'm really i need the art of this like what would you even point people towards to set up like what's a good one hi kip by the way in terms of a business, uh, you know, clearly everybody and their brother wants to be in the SaaS space right now. SaaS course, yeah. businesses are selling at crazy multiples. But, you know, I think there's actually a, a probably an easier way to, to build a business that you could actually sell, which is to find a very quiet corner of the economy where you can come up with a simple solution to something really, really simple that nobody else is doing and stick to your knitting, like do one thing better than anybody else. Because here's the thing, when when you go to sell your company, the acquirer, they're going to close the boardroom door. You're not going to be in the room. They're going to sit there in their little war room and they're going to say, do we really need to buy Brogan's company right. or should we just compete with it? And the only way they choose to buy it is if you've got such a, a moat, a competitive moat around you. In other words, you're so well known for one thing. It's so hard to replicate what you've done that it's like, you know what, just, let's just buy them, right? So, you know, I, there's a ton of stories in the book. One comes to mind. There's a guy named Jay Steinfeld who built blinds.com. Do you know his story at all? Not even a little bit. In, could you open the blinds? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, for sure. Steinfeld builds a, builds a business. Around the time of Bezos is selling books, Steinfeld starts to sell blinds online, builds it up over 25, 30 years, sold it recently. It was a $100 million company bought by Home Depot. Why does Home Depot buy a blinds company? Well, for one reason, they want to be number one in every SKU they sell, every product sure, they sell. Sure. The other reason is that Steinfeld has gotten really good at selling complicated things because you think about blinds, you got to measure them, you got to you know install them. It's kind of complicated. Home Depot is trying to get more people to buy from their online store, and sure. so they're like, "Let's buy Jay, and he can figure out how to sell all the other stuff online." So, I mean, Jay was not tempted to go buy and sell a bunch of other things. He just became the world's guru at how to sell blinds on, on, on online, which is why it became an attractive acquisition candidate. So it's a it's a two it's a two way street there because Home Depot gets a, an already thriving business that he's actually built a brand around great URL I mean blinds.com. This is like Zappos for uh, for Tony Shea over at uh, Amazon. Bezos said, "Man, this guy is killing it on customer service. I want that," and, and he acquires it. Uh, Walmart's doing the same. Walmart's acquiring anybody they can that has a way better version of uh, delivery for online specifically, brick, brick and mortar to click and mortar. Uh, is one of those sales uh, quality areas that you said, for instance, like um, acquisition. Meanwhile, Steinfeld, though, Home Depot can say, you are perfect at this. You figured out how to do the measuring thing in a way that makes nobody grumpy. You figured out this that made nobody grumpy. We want to sell bay windows or whatever. And, and sure. Steinfeld can work on that, not do his blinds brand, because Home Depot is going to take that info and plug it somewhere else that people are looking for. It's a bunch of micro sites in my world, right? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. <sighs> Yeah, I'm talking with you. I love talking with you. I'm going to give you an example of one. I made this up because this is a this is a guy I interviewed for one of my other shows, and he runs a company called Valkyrie. He's uh, uh, mailboxes for drone delivery, so he doesn't make drones. He makes wow. it super easy for drones to drop off a package. Now, so good. Yeah, right. So <laughs> like, he puts one oh, of these so out in good. a field somewhere because remember you got to put it somewhere a drone can fly over to it. Sure, it. sure. But those boxes aren't you know you don't own box one C. You've got an app. And the app says, go pick us up a 1C. You can tell the app a bunch of things, sort of like, uh, I'm in a wheelchair or that product is heavy. And so they'll say, oh, we'll put it on a lower one for you. You know, we'll put pillows up top. We'll put your like, you know, uh, safe that you ordered <laughs> down the bottom because, you know, <laughs> you're in the car. And so he's got it for this. He's also making new ones of these that can like hook to an apartment building ledge. So, you know, oh, the Amazon so drone cool. can like whip into the apartment building. So has he sold this company or is he, he's building it? He's building it. And he is. Okay. Very is so, so John Warlow, the art of, you know, selling your business. What does this guy need to be thinking about? What is, Oh my gosh. I need to know. Like line up the Brinks truck because Amazon is going to want to buy his company five times over. <laughs> um, or it's UPS or, or yeah. Or any of the delivery companies, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, what a beautiful, I mean, again, that's example of doing one thing and just sticking to your knitting and nailing that one execution. I'm reminded I did a built to sell radio interview with a guy named Jonathan Evans. Have you had Jonathan on this show? I haven't. 
Okay. So he, he built that drone company. He, he, so you know how like airplanes, they fly at like 33,000 feet eastbound and 34 westbound. So they oh, don't right. crash into each other or whatever. Yeah. He built that for drones. Wow. So the, so cool. And got acquired by Verizon because all of that network lives on, it re requires a lot of data, right? So Verizon is like, perfect. You're going to sell a truckload of data for us. And he bought, the, they, they bought his company. Uh, but that, that drone uh, thing sounds, I mean, sounds cool. And as long as they stick to doing that one thing and nailing it, they're going to have a ton of acquisition uh, opportunities. Does that become one of the most core premises of the art of selling your business? I mean, I'm sure in there, there's a lot of the obvious stuff, like keep some really good paperwork and make sure you know your everything and make sure you've accounted for that. But like the kind of vision stuff that I think of you as, and, and, and don't, you know, don't be weird. You're a visionary guy, John, like you <laughs> changed my business. Uh, what's in there that people need to think about and walk around with and like, what's going to be kind of like their mental chewing gum based on this book? Yeah, well, first of all, I try to do exactly the opposite of what you described. So make it like a textbook and like, here's like, Good. you got to do this. So that, like, it, not, not interesting. There's tons of stuff out there about like the mechanics of like, you know, this kind of agreement or that kind. So I tried not to do that. What I did was I, t I got these, I do this podcast called Pilots Our Radio where I've interviewed like 300 different entrepreneurs. And I tried to basically take all the best things that they do uh, to punch above their weight in a negotiation. And so when you think about selling, it's like a David and Goliath battle. There's this thing called the five to 20 rule, which essentially means that the natural acquirer for your business is going to be somewhere between five and 20 times the size of your company. So by definition, you're punching, you've got to punch well above your weight if you mm -hmm. want to kind of negotiate toe to toe. So it's really about how do you make sure you don't screw up this final stage of your entrepreneurial journey. So what are some of the classic mistakes to avoid? Um, you know, and, and some of the negotiation hacks, you know, one of the questions that a lot of entrepreneurs get at some point from an acquirer is like, so like, why do you want to sell this company? Right. And most of us won't want to say, because I've just lived through the shittiest year of my entire life and I don't really want to hold this business for any longer. That's right. I'm stressed, blah, blah, blah. But that's exactly the wrong answer to that question. So, you know, depending on how old you are and what your motivation is for selling, there's some scripting that you might want to choose that will that will be truthful, but put your best foot forward. So it's just yeah, kind of hacks and tips like that stuff. That's cool. By the way, you could totally check out uh, Built to Sell Radio because you really should. And it's at uh, builttosell.com slash radio, 300-ish episodes. That's pretty impressive stuff. Lots of nice people who are selling businesses. Kevin Harrington, I met him at a conference. Um, so good, good gaggle of humans that have sold things. So <laughs> good that's, gaggle of humans. <laughs> good gaggle. Um, so you know, it's so funny because as you're talking about this, like the one thing Scratchpad does a little differently than the Backpack Show is, I just talk to people I find interesting, um, and, and there doesn't have to necessarily be a theme because I get so into it that I don't necessarily. I don't want to help you sell your book. I want, I, I just want to hear your super brains. Like people are going to buy your book or not buy your book, but you know, with the concept of built to sell, you're thinking the whole time you make a business, you should, you should think, well, I should probably think about what it would be like if I'm going to sell this. It, it's not that hard to like the, the book title gives you the sense of what you got to get going on all that preamble for nothing to say. When I think about uh, businesses, the, the one thing you're saying is get tighter. The other thing you're saying is, you know, make sure that people understand that, you know, if you could do the one thing amazing, you're going to do so much better. Why do people have so much trouble believing that when they when they think? And I, I do too. I, I absolutely uh, try to become a dessert topping and a floor wax and a whatever. <laughs> dessert topping. You know, like the minute I think, you know, nobody likes what I'm doing anymore. You know, uh, that's when I like make the worst choices of my life. Why is that so mm -hmm. hard to stay the course? How can I hold the line? Ah, oh, I mean, like where do like so number one, cash flow. Like we don't have the luxury of of not paying the bills, right? So when a customer asks you to sell them something that you're weren't planning to sell them and and it's hard to turn down cash. And so I think for that reason, it, you know, it's one. I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, we're customer centric type of people. So we like to be pleasers. We like it when customers say nice things about us. And so for mm -hmm. that reason, we want to please customers all the time. And that often takes us off into territory we weren't intending to go. Um, 
you know, I, th- I think there's that. I think there's also this notion that we, that we chase the wrong yardsticks. You know, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's like, you know, I want to hit 5 million in revenue. That's my, my goal is 5 million. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'll come hooker by crook. I'm, and then it's 10 million. I got to hit 10 million in revenue. We have these sort of very top line oriented sort of goals. And, I, you know, your top line is not necessarily your most sexy attribute. I just interviewed a guy. Well, I'll give you two examples. I, I interviewed a guy earlier today. He built a $15 million company, one $5 million company, meaning sales of $15 million. And he thought it was worth 50% of revenue. Oh. And he got, a, he got about a third, less, a third of that. So that's on one side of the spectrum. Then I got I interviewed a guy named Rob Walling. Have you ever had Rob on the show? He, Drip is his company. It's an email marketing software acquired by lead pages. Built it to $2 million. Okay. So a business, whatever, almost a tenth of the size. So it figures it's worth between nine and 14 times top line revenue acquired by lead pages. So I share the, the two ends of the spectrum, like one company, you'd think, oh, it's just a mouse fart. It's 2 million bucks. It's nothing, right? Yet it's worth a multiple, like a many, many, many more multiples more than the $15 million company. So I think in some cases, we just chase the, the wrong yardstick because it fills our ego, but it doesn't necessarily fill our bank account <laughs> to use a, 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 a quick uh, comment. <clears throat> Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I'm thinking about the fact that, by the way, uh, what a great example of somebody like a Rob. Um, Rob Walling has done a bunch of different SaaS type projects again, which yes. we, we already said, if software as a service is like pretty much one of the sexiest businesses that way. But uh, I'm trying to get around. There, th- like you said, top line revenue isn't always the magic number. Uh, there's a lot of companies that base their uh, concept on EBITDA, uh, mm-hmm. earnings before interest and taxation to uh, depreciation and amortization. You said you weren't smart. I'm not. See that? That's a total lie. You I'm got not. that. Nailed it. it well, because if you hear EBITDA is a good way to measure a business and then somebody says to you, they have like a 14% EBITDA, you go, that's a big number and that's all you need to know. Like, yeah, really. I know secret words in a lot of different languages. That's all I know. There but, you, you know, if you sat sure me down with a book and said, calculate this EBITDA for me, I'd be like, I could probably fart a, a song if you gave me enough beans, like, uh, ee, ee, ee. I can probably get a song out of my butt, right? That's all I got. Boy, the way the everybody watching this live, a whole lot just ran away. Not even joking. The number like went, brrr, sounded like a fart. So um, now it's just us. So Rob Walling from Drip uh, is a great example. By the way, we should just watch your listen to your radio show. Why aren't you making a video show? You're good looking. Do you also I, have a video? Show? I it, yeah, we put up on YouTube for sure. Okay, okay, yeah. good. But yeah. talking heads, good. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Do that. Do you feel that the this is a total ninety degree segue? But do you feel that having your podcast, having your video, this kind of media, is that helping more as far as book stuff goes? I was just saying to somebody, and they thought I was joking again because if I tell someone I'm not smart, they don't believe me. I haven't read hardly half a book since the quarantine. My head just hasn't right? been there. I've just been so like not – I've done some audio books. That's about as good as you're going to get. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think these other methods of media are helping you as far as delivery of, of the important stuff, which is your intellectual property and your ide- ideas? It's not – you know, you're not going to get rich selling books. That's – talk about a business you can't sell. Um, but do you think this is helping you? Because you have these great interviews and you have all this great content, like to be a to make your own show, basically, is that important to you? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, <clears throat> my day job is I run this company, Value Builder, and so that's a different business model into itself. We license the software to to advisors, so that's busy. And I guess, and to some level, the video, the like interviews and stuff I do, somewhat supports Value Builder, although it's a little bit less direct than, than the book stuff. Sure. Um, you know, I, I find the podcast is, is it helps me sort of connect with people because I think people feel like they get to know me more. Like I think when, when I write, I have a certain, uh, I don't know, a way of writing and that sort of has this perception I think of, of some people have of me. And then when I do the podcast, it's obviously much more conversational and they, they're like, Oh, okay. Like 
I didn't know that about that guy or like whatever. And, or I, you know, I thought he was way smarter when I read his stuff. Now I think he's an idiot because when I actually see him talk, <laughs> but whatever, that is, uh, that's, I don't know. That's been a fun piece. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Did you make books and media to establish oneself as a thought leader, such as it were, or not really? Um, you know, actually I did years and years ago, uh, cause I actually have written four books, three of which you, you, you mentioned and which was very generous of you. There's a fourth book, which I never talk about, which is sort of like behind the scenes. It's like, Oh yeah. I, I sort of, that that one. yeah, yeah. It, it was a book. Don't look it up on the internet. Chris, not, I could see your eyes not, looking. You I, are. I was really typing. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it was a shitty book. Anyways, <laughs> it was, it was, I used to have, I used to own this company. We did market research, quantitative mm -hmm. market research, help the help companies built and uh, market to small business owners. So I wrote a book about that topic, which was very, very, very niche. Really, the only audience was like Fortune 500 marketers. By definition, there's like 500 of them. So that was a really stupid idea for a book. But <laughs> in any event, that book was as you described. It was sort of a, a, a big lumpy calling card, sort of business card, and, and it worked. It put us on the map. But no, it built to sell uh, and the other so, since then. Um, it's it's a little less about the the day to day company. In fact, actually, it almost undermines the value of the day to day company in a way because if I'm too public out there with books, it it makes it be like, oh well, like you could never sell his company if he if it's so reliant on him doing video interviews. You know what I mean? So uh, we try to really separate the two. Value builder is it is it you know it's got its own president. It's not like my face isn't on the head in, on the homepage. You know what I mean? Like it's yep, it's yep, yep. we're trying to eat our own dog food as <laughs> best we can. And that's an important thing too. That's the other reason why I can't like really use your books directly the way I should, because you know, I, I'm a personality seller. Like I sell on my personality. So you buy me to buy this. Right. And that's tricky. And a lot of, a lot of founders uh, get, get caught in that kind of mode. I never think of myself as a founder. That's an awful word, but like, you know, if, if you're Wendy from Snapple, you know, it's kind of hard not to, to go right. with, right? So that's hard. Yeah. It's, it's hard for people to realize that the business has to, you know, not, well, hard for some people that the business cannot run on personality. It has to run on the merits of its product. Yeah, it's no, for sure. For sure. It's got to, it's got to somehow separate. I mean, my best advice there is, is to really invest in product names. In, in, in lieu of a product name, people go, oh yeah, Brogan's company. Right? Yep. But if, yep. if you have the such and such product, it, it can start to take a higher level of branding than just you. So in the absence of, of really like, especially if you sell a service where it's, it's a somewhat generic service, marketing, consulting, PR, like that kind of stuff, it, it, it then becomes very personality driven. Whereas if you can really invest in building a product name, it can, your, your personal name or personal brand can some sometimes take a backseat to that. Like a value builder system. Maybe <laughs> that would be a good product that has nothing to do with John Warlow, except, you know, because he made it. Uh, I totally get it. So that's great. Uh, the book is The Art of Selling Your Business. That comes out in January? January, yeah. For oh. sure. So your relatives who don't know what you read but know that you like to read, and they're going to give you the Amazon gift card or the Barnes gift card, or even better, support your local indie bookseller, yeah. uh, you can put your money down and pick up this book right now. cbrogan.me slash sell your business is going to take you right to the evil empire. Uh, but you know, it's anywhere you can buy a book. John Warlow, thanks for swinging by. This mattered. Thanks, Chris Brogan. You're a good man. I'm hitting this button. It's going to get loud. <laughs>